Sup, Bobby? I'm Leon, the paperback maniac, coming at you with another vintage horror book review. Today, we are taking a look at Nightflyer by Christopher Fahey. This book was published by Jove in 1982. I will begin by reading the back cover synopsis. Jonathan is in his room, but he's not in his body. Jonathan Petrie can leave his body and fly. Best of all, nobody knows it. Yet. Not his alcoholic, ailing mother, nor his uncaring father. Not the teacher who senses that he's changing, nor the girl who befriends him. And surely not the school kids who torment him mercilessly. None of them knows the force he commands, that he can see without being seen, hear without being heard, and that even now, as the night winds howl, he's plotting his revenge on them all. <clears throat> so here we have another novel that deals with astral projection, a concept that I think is super cool and just perfect horror novel fodder. It's been used before in books like Ramsey Campbell's The Parasite, um, the, uh, Gary Brander's Floater, a personal favorite of mine, and... Uh, a book that I reviewed on this channel a while back called The Keeper of the Children. I like it best, however, when it deals with kids, as is the case here. Uh, so this novel uh, follows 15-year-old Jonathan Petrie, an outcast and quite an oddball uh, who is, um, you know, quite different uh, from kids his age. He's the kind of kid who walks around carrying a briefcase. He uh, has these thick wire-rimmed spectacles that keep sliding down his face. You know, he's thin, he, he's small for his age, easily picked on. Uh, this is the kind of kid, uh, sensitive kid, you know, not interested in sports or, you know, the usual, like, teenage things. Uh, he likes to collect butterflies and actually is quite the authority on them. In fact, his whole room uh, is, you know, mounted with these the butterflies that he collects. Uh, he's also the kind of kid who talks to his childhood stuffed animal, Eeyore, uh, which is propped up on his bookcase, because he's got no one else at home to talk to, uh, which, you know, is, is really sad. And, uh, you know, Jonathan, we quickly see, is is quite a, uh, you know, a pathetic character in the true sense of, you know, there's a lot of pathos uh, there for this character. Uh, his father is sort of like a macho asshole, uh, this businessman who just cannot relate or connect to his son in any way, does not understand him. His mother is perpetually sick uh, and is an alcoholic. And so Jonathan really has no one at home to talk to. So instead, you know, he... This is the kind of kid who, um, when a bird smacks into his bedroom window, he, he quickly rushes out of brings the bird inside, nurses it to health in a cardboard box, uh, christens it Lucifer, and keeps it as a secret pet. So, um, yeah, I think he's got like one friend in all the world, a kid with cerebral palsy named Chucky, and uh, and, and there's the, a girl who's kind of nice to him, uh, and a girl uh, who he is secretly in love with. But, uh, you know, does not have a very happy uh, happy life, J Jonathan. Um, one One night... While he's uh, lying in bed and thinking of his pet bird, Lucifer, he realizes that he can uh, float up above his body. And then he realizes that he has uh, acquired the gift of astral projection and that he can actually, you know, rise up insubstantial as air, uh, invisible, and, and then he can actually fly and that he can kind of go and fly around, fly around the town, uh, and, and he starts to do this, and this becomes like his escape, and, and he loves it, you know. Finally, he can trap the prison of his body and his, you know, miserable existence. He can leave his shitty family, uh, you know, his house, and he can just kind of be free and float up like the butterflies he loves so much and, um, you know, just explore and this sort of like becomes his release. This becomes sort of like his his mode of liberation of just escaping the, the terrible reality uh, of his existence. And um, as he sort of continues to do this, he realizes that that he can use these this power to uh, protect himself, so that he can you know start by you know. Maybe like spying on his enemies, these bullies. There are, there are a group of like a few kids from his school 
who are just the utmost worst bullies you could read about. I mean, it's very 80s, right, to have bullies like this, but this book, I mean, these bullies are next level. I mean, these are just pure evil kids. The things that they do to poor Jonathan, like uh, make him lick a frozen uh, railroad track so that, his, so that he's is stuck to the tracks as a train is coming along on a parallel track, but that Jonathan thinks is going to hit him, and that the only way he can extricate himself is by barfing up all over his tongue. Uh, and that, you know, they like lock him up in like a boarded up remote wooden cabin and set it on fire so that he thinks he's going to, you know, burn. The, they put light firecrackers down his back. I mean, these are just awful kids. So, and they make him do all of their homework. Uh, for they, they make him do their homework for him, so it's just really, really uh, bad. So he thinks, okay, well, if I spy on them, maybe I can like you know protect myself if you know find out like what they're planning on doing to me. And um, you know, as he does this, uh, things start to kind of go awry. Uh, so I mentioned earlier his father who uh, does not understand his son. His father is planning on sending uh, Jonathan to military or some sort of like um, special school out of state. And of course, Jonathan uh, does not want this at all. So he thinks, okay, well, maybe I can tip off this local uh, street gang, which he's been secretly uh, spying on. I can tip him off that the psychiatrist who is going to write a, a recommendation uh, to this school to send me to, I uh, can tip them off that this guy's going to be at a certain location at a certain time with a bunch of money. And he does that, but then the street gang, uh, you know, something goes wrong and the psychiatrist gets murdered. So, you know, in an effort to protect himself, things like this happen. It always backfires in, in some way and someone dies. Um, and, you know, he does do something at a certain point that leads to the deaths of one of the bullies. And, uh, you know, and then this opens up something in Jonathan and he realizes that, you know, he's kind of in control now and that he can, that he, he no longer needs to be a victim, that he can, you know, he's fed up with the way people treat him and that he can, you know, use these powers to his advantage. And he starts to become, you know, a little less... Uh, you know, sort of like uh, concerned, I guess, you know, for, for the welfare of others. But he never outright, well, at least, you know, for a good portion of the book, he does not uh, surprisingly become like this evil entity, like how I thought, you know, like a book like Floater. He never becomes like an, like an outright ghost who's going to go on like some murderous rampage. Uh, the pathos remains uh, for a good portion of this book, and he really just wants to to, to protect himself, right? He just wants to, you know, he, he's trying things and he feels like uh, he has no other recourse than, than to, to do the actions, you know, that he does while, uh, you know, astral projection, projecting. And, you know, but of course he is in love with this girl uh, from his school who's, you know, friendly with him, but who's secretly seeing another guy. And, uh, and he thinks that he, he wants to, you know, leave this earthly plane, uh, but he would like to take her, you know, with him uh, because, you know, he feels like, oh, they're soulmates. And, um, and he really, the more and more that he flies, the more and more disgusted he uh, gets uh, with the world itself. He, he kind of just sees it as this place of ugliness and meanness and cruelty uh, he is absolutely just appalled by everything. You know, the more he spies on people, the more he learns, the more disgust he has. You know, he, he spies on his teacher. He he, he sees that his teacher is uh, having an affair, uh, you know, like with the principal. Uh, when he spies on his parents, he learns some cruel things. Um, you know, when he – one day he accidentally uh, – flies into uh, a, like a porno screening thinking that he's going into a love story and is absolutely appalled. Uh, that's another way that this kid is like a little different. He finds the idea of sex abhorrent and just like just completely just repulsive and distasteful. So yeah, he just sees this world as just a sick place that, that he wants to just escape. And, you know, as the book goes on, he is is just grows listless and just uninterested in anything except flying. He becomes like, you know, sallow, he stops eating, he starts losing weight. All he wants to do is fly. I mean, the book could be seen as a metaphor for like addiction because uh, it's definitely, you know, he definitely becomes addicted to it. It could be seen as a metaphor for like, you know, drug use, all kinds of things. Um, 
But eventually, you know, he just, yeah, is fed up and is not, does not care, uh, is, is willing, is going to start fighting back. And in that way, you know, this book shows you kind of like the process of what, what it takes to, for the, a lot of times when you hear about these kids who just kind of snap, right. And then they just lose it and they'll, whatever, you know, you hear about these kids all the time. They murder their families. They go into a school and just, you know, basically they've completely, uh, just lost any semblance of humanity at this point because they've been tortured so much and they, and they become a little unhinged. And, and that is kind of what happens here. Although it does definitely take its time and, you know, I will warn people that this is does not even really feel like a horror novel for, you know, even like a good two thirds of it. This is definitely much more of sort of like a coming of age drama of this kid and just like, you know, his, his terrible existence. Um, but really, really well done. I think that this book definitely is a great evocation of adolescent uh, just anguish and sadness. I think uh, not unlike a book that I really enjoyed and uh, reviewed last year called uh, The Voice of the Night. I think that if you enjoy uh, stuff like that, then then this is one one to check out. But uh, yeah, not a lot of you know outright horror. Uh, at first, definitely takes its time. And even at the end, you know, you're not going to get like some crazy, like, you know, balls to the wall fi finale. Although the ending, um, you know, I will say at first, I wasn't quite sure what I thought of the ending. I, in the beginning, it seemed a little oddly like it was like going all like religious, like spiritual religious. But then at the very end, I, I think, you know, upon thinking about it now, I, I do like the ending. It kind of uh, fits well with what we've seen you know, of, of like how these, the actions that Jonathan is doing to protect himself, how they always kind of backfire in some way. So I thought the ending was sort of uh, appropriate and, you know, everyone really at the end gets their just desserts. Let's, let's say that. Um, but yeah, Night Flyer, this I think, uh, was a, just a really, really good book. I would recommend this uh, to you guys. If you're like me and you enjoy adolescent sort of coming of age horror, uh, you know, not, not so heavy on the horror, but definitely just a great sort of depiction of the pain of adolescence. You know, this book really shows uh, sort of the disconnect that can exist between adults and adolescence. You know, I told you, uh, Jonathan, uh, the the uh, depiction of Jonathan and his father's relationship, especially, I thought was really well done. Um, you know, and you know, for a, a guy, we get into Jonathan's father's mind, and just he is just completely disappointed in his son, and just does not understand him. Wishes that he had a, a like you know, quote unquote, regular boy who would do things with him, like you know, play baseball. Why doesn't this kid? Why is he interested in like you know, sports and things like that? And um, you know, and, and Jonathan just doesn't understand his father at all either. And, you know, there, there is a heartbreaking scene sort of early on in the book when uh, Jonathan's father asks him, like, hey, you know, why why do you always stay up in your room? Why don't you go out and play outside like other kids? And Jonathan, you know, he, he makes up some excuse. And in reality, he's thinking, well, in my room, I'm safe. You know, like in my room, I'm not going to be taunted. I'm not going to be like, uh, you know, <laughs> assaulted or made fun of. Uh, my room is is like, you know, kind of like my comfort zone. And, um, you know, by the way, besides like he has to do like all this homework for the other kids. So he's always busy. Uh, but of course he doesn't tell his father this. And, and I thought that was, you know, that, that felt true to me because, you know, growing up and, and even now I'm the kind of person myself who, if someone's asking me like, like, how are you doing? Is everything okay? Even if things are not okay, I'll lie and say, sure, they're fine. You know, cause I don't want to like get into it with someone, but, um, I could really relate in many ways uh, to, to Jonathan, um, you know, even though he's definitely an, an oddball, but, uh, you know, there's something there, I think, for anyone who's felt that sort of adolescent sort of pain and rejection. I thought it was really, really well handled here. And, you know, the writing is solid. Uh, it's crisp. It's uh, concise. It's, you know, it's got the right amount of detail. Uh, yeah, I just, I really enjoyed this book and I would highly recommend it for you guys to check out. So, yeah, that is Night Flyer by Christopher Fahey. I uh, definitely uh, hope to read more Christopher Fahey books. I've got a, I've got a couple other books of his uh, on my shelf that uh, I'm now looking forward uh, to getting to. So 
yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the review. Uh, thanks for watching as always. You know, as always, be on the lookout for uh, more fun stuff uh, coming up in the future. Until my next video, I will, or I don't know, until the next time. Oh, here's, here's the time for the awkward close, right? I can never fucking close these videos uh, in a way that seems smooth or effortless. I always, it's always awkward, but uh, I don't know. I still haven't figured out what to say. Uh, until next time, take it easy. Peace out.